And we are live. All right, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm Maisel Beek, and I am super happy to welcome you all to our second talk of the series, uh, Screaming, Screaming, Human Nature in Crisis. Today, we have a very special guest speaker, a uh, thoughtful and very feeling artist, and we'll be hearing from Moselle Matrushi about her project, An Edible Gold. But I will uh, not be introducing Moza, rather I will introduce our discussant for the day who will later uh, speak a bit more about Moza and her practice and then lead the discussion after, uh, afterwards. And today's discussion is Ritika Biswas, who is a curator currently working on decolonial virtual art platforms and non-human ecologies. Ritika sees her practice as existing at the nexus of deep research, eco-critical play, collaborative kinship, and justice, particularly within majority world contexts. She is the 2022 International Research Fellow at the Museum of Modern and Contemporary Art, Seoul, and I'm very happy to say um, a participant in our curatorial development program, uh, which is in partnership with BICAR, the Bombay Institute for Critical Analysis and Research. Um, in our program, uh, Ritika is unpacking and sharing um, a research project of her, a curatorial research project of hers titled Anxious Eco Bodies, uh, where she explores a space of co dwelling in our located and shared flows of anxiety um, and imagining forms of human and non human kinship that might take form through, just, uh, through these intersections. So, without taking any more of our time, Ritika, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Mais. Um, yeah, very excited to have Mozal Matrushi here, whose talk is entitled An Edible Gold. Um, just to briefly introduce Mozal here, Mozal Matrushi is a UAE-based conceptual artist and writer. She obtained an MFA from the Slade School of Fine Art in London, UK in 2019. Al Matrushi's practice operates within the study of erased mythology of the Arabian Peninsula and correlates these myths with the structures that are upheld by the present regional political climate. Through a fictive lens, her themes materialize in performances, moving image, audio media, as well as text. Moses' work has been performed in the Victorian Albert Museum in London, selected by the ICA London and BBC for the new creatives project, as well as displayed in the second Lahore Biennale. Moza is a recipient of the inaugural Warehouse 421 Artistic Research Grant, very, very pleased to have you with us, Moza. Um, just want to do a little bit of housekeeping. In general, we'll have a five minute break for um, everybody uh, who's who's watching this call as well as the, as well as the participants um, right after Moza's call. But in the meanwhile, it, Moza's talk, sorry. Uh, but in the meanwhile, please do send in your questions as Moza's talking as the uh, lecture is sort of ongoing, either via the YouTube chat or the Zoom um, chat, depending on what, which one you're on right now. And yeah, this is just to kind of take a breather from the talk as well as sort of uh, coagulate all of our thoughts and come back to the table ready for discussion. Um, yeah, so thank you very much and over to Moza. Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm really pleased to be here and to talk about bees, you know, which is not a rare occasion. <laughs> um, so um, we'll begin, um, and if my friend Kunal can just share the screen, thank you so much. Uh, so I've titled this an edible gold in reference to um, a body of work that I started uh, that's called uh, There is an Edible Gold, Here is an Edible Gold, This is an Edible Gold. So it, it, these titles kind of uh, vary according to what medium uh, the output is in. But before I start to talk about um, this work, um, I'd love to just take you on a journey of how this whole thing started. So if you, we can just go to the first slide. Uh, before we uh, start, I wanted to share with you this um, Google translated um, excerpt of uh, Zakaria Tamar's um, a short story, Ayyohad Karaz al Mansi, or Oh Forgotten Cherries. And this is, you know, this is a major spoiler alert. This is literally the ending of the story. And I'd love to read it uh, for you in Arabic, um, which is the original language that it was written in, while you have this um, 
translation uh, for you if, if you maybe don't understand Arabic. Um, let's see. Okay. Okay. Um, ونزل منه أبو فياض عابس الوجه واجما وكانت إحدى يديه ما زالت تحمل سلة الكرز تصايحنا بدهشة لماذا لم تعطي عمر سلة الكرز ألم تقابله ماذا قال لك ظل أبو فياض ساكتا كأنه أصم ووضع سلة الكرز على الأرض وتكلم بصوت أجش فقال للصغار تعالوا وكلوا الكرز وعندما تكبرون لا تنسوا طعمه ثم مشى متجها إلى بيته فاعترضنا طريقه وقلنا له تكلم وأخبرنا بما حدث قال أبو فياض عمر مات فزعلنا كأن أمنا قد ماتت بينما عاود أبو فياض السير وقد ازداد ظهره انحناء. Uh, to not fully um, spoil the story for you, but um, I thought it was important to, to reach back into the story. So uh, Zakaria Tamar is a Syrian journalist and short story writer, and I've encountered his work when I was a student many years ago, um, and was really taken by the the thought of using food um, as a metaphor or a stand-in for language to talk about themes of oppression and also liberation and really this is where my journey has started uh, towards the earlier years of my practice um, and really I, I invite you all to go looking for the story you can also get in touch with me and I'll just send you a pdf or a link um, it's, it's highly accessible um, Kunal if we can go to the next slide uh, towards the days of my undergrad studies, uh, sorry, postgrad studies actually at the Slade, um, when I was uh, very playfully looking at um, themes of honey and uh, bees um, as just this, you know, very direct metaphor for um, mobilization and organization, kind of militaristic societies and. Um, and how they organize themselves. And I've, I became really taken by any mention of bees in, in literature or even honey as uh, something that is, um, has these cultural and religious uh, connotations that were, um, you know, just from my embodied experience as well and, um, and how I could translate those. But really at this point, I wasn't, very deep into the world of bees. I was just scratching the surface constantly. And mostly the work that was the outcome of, um, of these metaphors was, um, I suppose, work that was just containing a lot of my anxieties about, uh, um, about these themes, about how people or societies can be mobilized. Um, and, oh, and, and if we can go to the next slide, let me see that I'm not really missing anything. But then after, um, after graduating, I kind of had a slow move back to the UAE. I spent some time in Cairo in a residency. Um, and also I took the time to go into culinary school to really delve deeper into not only thinking about food, but actually professionalizing food and becoming a chef. So I'm trained as a pastry chef and was looking at how bodies uh, could be controlled uh, by the spatial parameters of commercial kitchens um, and how they can be mechanized uh, based on what is produced. Um, this is a still uh, from uh, one of my films that I produced at the time uh, called Glaze. It was um, commissioned uh, by the Lahore Biennial Foundation. Um, and uh, for the Lahore Biennial in 2020, which was curated by Hurun Qasimi. And um, this was really looking at different bakeries in Sharjah that are that come from various communities for, for their own specific communities and looking at these relationships of building trust and, dis and distrust in these really um, intimate and vulnerable spaces of uh, 
kind of the back kitchens and what happens in there. Um, and um, I've, I've at this point taken it as a style to not really film any faces. So mostly you see hands and bodies working. So it creates um, this, uh, I suppose the sensation of just everything becoming unified in this one wave of movement uh, over and over again. And this was uh, displayed in the um, in Pak Tea House in Lahore, which uh, has uh, this history of where the leftists would gather and, um, and organize and discuss certain things. Um, and we've just taken the screen that already exists in the tea house and displayed it there. And uh, I created a menu um, based on uh, or inspired by uh, some of the desserts that show up in the film. Uh, so um, that also was standing in for some sort of translation of what can you do with the ingredients that uh, are non kind of, they, they don't exist. Uh, uh, you know, we're talking about certain desserts, but the ingredients differed from what was used in the UAE and what was available in Lahore. Um, and then pairing, I would say all my films at this point um, uh, is um, there's always a fictional narrative that's paired uh, with the visuals that sometimes don't really have to do so much with what is being presented. Um, and in this film in particular, in Glaze, um, you don't hear the narrative, you just read it and uh, it goes from English to Arabic and kind of tries to throw you off. But for people who could access Urdu, uh, they were able to just read the full story uh, when getting the menu, the dessert menu, um, as they viewed the work in Pak Tea House. Um, if we can move to the next slide. Um, so towards, I want to say, the end of 2020, a lot of my uh, fears and anxieties that I portrayed in my artwork ironically became realized. Um, and that has, uh, I'm not going to really get into that, but it, it, it kind of spun me into going back to looking at bees again. Um, but at the same time, I was a bit unsure as to how to go about that, because at this point, I felt the sense of urgency to really learn more about them. And so one day in early 2021, uh, yes, um, I have just gone to this honey festival in Hetta. Um, Hetta is a little town uh, close to the border of Oman. It's under the municipality of Dubai, but it's not really geographically linked so much to uh, the city of Dubai. And they host this annual honey festival where a lot of the local beekeepers uh, gather and display their products among other things. Um, and so I met this beekeeper there um, who has a, a mobile apiary practice. So he moves his bees from uh, one location to the other according to the season of uh, uh, the native flora or the, the blooming of the native flora um, and extracts honey in this way. And so I got really excited to learn about that from him and asked him if I could just shadow him and learn how to become a beekeeper after just, um, you know, just obsessively looking at bees for, for the past few years before that. And he was very generous and has allowed me to follow him. But one of the first things I had to do was um, sneak into the airport <laughs> um, to understand how they import the bees. And why I say sneak, and obviously I could just go and see this, but uh, cameras were not allowed. And so, um, you know, I just, I did not have it in me to go through the whole system to, to get that kind of approval. Uh, and so I just went uh, with, my, with my phone and uh, captured as much as I could. Um, but also I started to then see, um, I think that was the start of my romantic ideals as well, becoming uh, like just unraveling um, because I could see, you know, um, all the honey producers that I would know, whether they have uh, big productions or really small or lo-fi productions, they were there waiting for their bees. So I started to question, where are the local bees? 
um, and found out uh, very soon after that there was no such thing and that uh, all the bees are imported. Um, and there are European species um, that are bred in Egypt and so they're imported from Egypt and they come in these uh, specific travel boxes. I don't know if you can see in the corner, uh, these boxes uh, in the corner of the image, these boxes that have uh, these um, circles in them uh, that look different from the white hives. Uh, these are the travel boxes that the bees come in. Um, and um, and I, I suppose I started to form more questions as we went along because the beekeeper, um, well, first of all, I wanted to also position him as my primary source of information. So I wasn't looking for this information in different courses at that time or um, trying to find it online because my experience from before was whenever I tried to find this information, it was all uh, or most of it uh, would speak of the seasons that are um, not really the same the same climate or the same seasons that we have in, in the UAE or even the, in the Gulf. Uh, and so it was very hard to match that. And so for me, that was the best way uh, to learn um, about the seasonality of this kind of practice um, back home. Um, but also to disturb this hierarchy of how to receive information uh, from scientific or academic resources and actually receive information from people who are working in, um, in the specific fields that they're working in and practicing this every day. Um, and so what also struck me about him is he, he's very religious. Um, he's a very religious Muslim man. Um, and so he had a lot of references from uh, Quran and um, and I suppose a, a hadith or a sunnah um, that he would pull from about this, you know, how bees are just the most amazing thing that could have ever happened to us because honey, in, in his belief, uh, cures everything. And um, I started to see how much he appreciates the bees, but how much of a, um, an element of human exceptionalism he also um, layered on them. Um, what I mean to say is that he um, truly believed that they were meant to be employed by us humans. If we can go to the next slide. Um, and so I think this was really the moment as well when it started to crack for me that I wasn't just following him around to learn and just record things on my camera to become a beekeeper. <laughs> this was when my, my romance with that idea ended. And um, I, I realized the urgency of really recording this to do something with it. Uh, especially when he started to talk about as well that honey, um, his goal was to make this honey, um, you know, just one of the best um, honey that can come out of the UAE and essentially nationalizing this product. Um, and when I had asked him where he learned um, beekeeping from and, and honey and getting into honey production, uh, he referred to um, a Yemeni man that uh, lives close to where he lived, um, who has taught him this and and regionally also, it's just known that Yemeni honey at this point is the most kind of like popular um, and the most kind of beneficial medicinal kind of honey um, in the region. I want to say in the Arabian Peninsula, um, but because of uh, because of the conflict that has been going on, um, or because of the war, I suppose that has been going on for years. Um, you know, just socially, uh, the the perception of how valuable this honey is started to shift as well. Uh, and so I became interested in how, you know, the beekeeper wanted to nationalize this product, but at the same time, the bees were imported. Um, if we can go to the next slide. Um, I also became really interested in these moments where the bees would kind of just do things that were not expected of them in their spare time, which I don't know how they had any spare time. But here you, in this picture, you see that uh, they kind of formed like this little nest within the hive. And so because bees really 
in their natural lifespan would only die of exhaustion. They never stop working uh, unless they were eaten by a bird or, uh, or another predator um, or face anything as, you know, anything that's sudden, they, their natural life would just end by them um, dying of exhaustion. And so I think also in these moments, I started to really look at them as much as a source of information as the beekeeper himself. Um, I don't know if I'm comfortable enough to use the word collaborate. I have used the word collaborators when I've spoken of bees before, um, because really also that's what it felt like. It felt like they were really informing this work um, as much as the beekeeper um, or even I have at, uh, at that moment. Um, if we can go to the next slide. Um, and and I um, it was a bit yeah I think it was also a bit uh, interesting to see how much the beekeeper would perform in front of the camera uh, and so a lot of information was lost because I'd had to very visibly close the camera and just say well I'm just listening to you to learn and not really to make this you know big flashy film um, in the end um, and. Um, in those moments, I started to also uh, um, put to the test how much I can absorb as someone who's not really working um, in the apiary as much as he is or interacting with the flora or with the bees as much as he is and that this is actually his livelihood. Um, and I started to question how much can, I mean, at, to some extent, we're all implicated in um, in what this practice is doing, but how much can I place on the beekeeper himself when it's a bigger system that I should be questioning that's kind of entrapping him into working in, in this way. And I'll explain more about how he's working. Um, sorry, I'm gonna cheat and like just glance over at my notes very quickly. Um, Um, and so, yeah, I, it, going back to the idea of well, can this um, honey be classified as Emirati honey if it's being, you know, extracted from the work of these immigrant bees, I suppose. And I started to question the relevance of indigeneity. And this is not to suggest that it's irrelevant. I think I started to look at indigeneity as different strands um, that exists over time in a place like the UAE specifically. Um, and so, um, if, uh, for example, um, and, and I'll talk about this more as well towards the end, but um, I've, I'm currently um, linked with different mountain tribes, um, different mountain indigenous tribes um, that have been keeping um, these agricultural civilizations for, for years um, and have been foraging for honey for years and years and years. Um, but at the same time, you know, what does that mean for other, um, I suppose, other keepers of, of knowledge um, that have either migrated uh, through or moved around and kind of like formed what we now call as the UAE? Um, and this is really what the work started to really look into as this kind of like crisis of what to call uh, indigenous and what to kind of like call, uh, you know, this big, um, big part of uh, nationalizing an identity as well. Um, if we could go to the next slide. I'm afraid I'm going too fast, but it's okay. That might leave us <laughs> with a lot of discussion time. Um, and yeah, this also, you know, this also came about from observing something of, um, that I found a bit strange, which is the project to create an Emirati bee. I know this sounds funny, but it's actually true. Um, so there has been a project, I believe, that's around seven years old now, um, that looks into um, uh, creating hybrids um, 
of a perfect Emirati bee that can withstand the Emirati climate and not die off. Um, this is also because the honey producers um, find it much easier to import bees um, every production cycle. Um, and this means that the bees die off in the end without being properly kept uh, because domesticated bees or, um, you know, they, they'd have to be fed and, and kept and really taken care of just like any other animal that's domesticated. Um, and so that there's very little of that happening and it's much more feasible for honey producers to, um, to just kind of let them die off, which, you know, I, I found very strange. I mean, not really strange, but I think stranger than that was, you know, where this kind of like Emirati B project was going and um, you know, is it is it gonna happen also in time that beekeepers or honey producers are going to start to change their habits because of it, if they've already developed a way in kind of creating these cycles that are more um, viable for them as honey producers. Um, and I'm and I'm really talking about people who value the bees and value the product so much, but still work in these ways. Um, if we can go to the next slide. Um, so at this point, I think I just want to share the excerpt of the film that tried to contain all of these thoughts together. Um, I won't talk about it so much. I guess I'll just show it and then, oh. Uh, one second. Uh, can you see my desktop? This is very embarrassing. Um, <laughs> yeah, no I, I do this all the time. I think I. I, I <laughs> <laughs> One second, I can't even see what I'm sharing. Um, well, can you see it now? Sorry, can you actually tell me if you're seeing the excerpt as it's playing? Yes, we can we can okay. hear it and see it. Yeah. Okay, great. السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته حياكم الله اخواني اهلا وسهلا اليوم عندنا فارس عسى الله اللي طال انتظاره حملت نفسي إلى العاملات في الخلية لعلني أجدهن على متسع من الوقت والعلم والاستقرار لإيضاح ما ظل غامضاً لم أجد لاستقرارهن عنوان ولكن مع ذلك لازمني الصمود واتجهت إليهن بأسئلة القديمة والحديثة أصواتهن طوت صوتي الذي بات لا نبرة له كنا منشغلات بطعام الملكة الجديدة التي وضعت في قفص خشية من ثورة العاملات عليها قبل تمسكها بالحكم لم يتوجوها بعد فهي ضعيفة ورهيفة إنها غريبة وليس لسلالتها وضوح الواضح فقط هو اختلافها عنهن حياتها ومصير حكمها يعتمد على مدى تقبل العاملات لها فعليها أن تمكث في سجنها حتى تصدر الخلية قراراً جماعياً للسماح لها بتولي عرش الحكم Oh. Uh. 
um, no, like normally he will die because first of all they don't feed themselves. They need to beg for food from the workers. And oh. second of all, their only task in life is to mate. So since he's blind, he won't be able to fly. هل هذه الديمقراطية؟ فتحت فمي لأسأل، لكن لم يتدحرج صوتي من لساني، ولو فعل ذلك لن تبالي العاملات بالرد عليه. مليون يومين بنحطهم داخل الخلية عشان النحل يتعرف عليه، لو نزلناها الحين النحل بيقتلها على طول. اه والله؟ ايه بيقتلها ما يعرفها. انت دخلتي بيت بيت ناس بيخلونك؟ ها؟ ان شاء الله يعني. ما يخلونك على طول. Thank you. So this is the the last image you saw. It's also uh, the still, which is when um, the bees were drowning in their own honey um, as it was being extracted. And this is not to say that this is the only way that honey could be extracted. But as I said, um, the beekeeper that I was following had such a small and low fi production that um, that this is the way he kind of you know this is the way he found that works for him the most. And since the bees' lives were not only disposable, but can be exchanged so quickly, um, he didn't see a problem in, in trying to remedy that. Um, and so this film, um, along with the sound piece and a series of workshops, went to um, Hay Jamil in, uh, in Saudi Arabia and Jeddah, and their inaugural uh, exhibition called uh, Staples, What's on Your Plate, which was um, curated by Rahul Gudipudi and uh, Danny Burroughs, who uh, was the person who set up the Politics of Food program in Delfina Foundation, which is where I am at the moment, and uh, currently in the fifth season of the Politics of Food. Um, and still looking at a lot of this, but uh, what I wanted to touch upon here is, if we can go to the next slide, I believe. Um, there's a picture of the workshop, yes, um, is this was, um, so this is an image of the workshop series that was part of the, uh, of the artwork of, or the body of work, which was led by a beekeeper who runs a similar practice where he takes, he moves his bees around across Saudi Arabia, uh, but he does it in a, in a bit more sustainable way and, and uh, has developed um, a learning program into uh, teaching people how to uh, keep bees in urban environments in Saudi. Um, and so the what was very interesting is that, first of all, the workshops were so popular that they were booked out immediately. Um, they were free, I believe. Um, we were really keen on keeping them as accessible as possible. Uh, but um, as I said, they were so popular that the participants demanded um, 
to have another series of advanced, what they would call advanced beekeeping courses with him in the in Haijami. Um, and they also stated what kind of things they wanted to learn, including things like carpentry and uh, you know how to build your own uh, beehive and also thinking about the, you know, the the design of honey extraction or honey extractors that are a bit more sustainable and and things like that and that was very interesting for me as it was kind of forming from the ground up and my role was becoming smaller and smaller as kind of like this facilitator of everything and that made me also think about well what is my role as the artist outside of kind of creating the um conceptual uh, framework around the work that's meant to be absorbed in the gallery space, but what could also happen outside of the gallery space. Um, if we go to the next slide. Um, also during that time, I did cave in and uh, I joined the Beekeepers Association for some courses. <laughs> and became a certified beekeeper, which I don't know what that means because I don't have any hives at the moment and I'm not really practically a beekeeper, but it, it brings back this question of the hierarchies of knowledge and kind of, um, I suppose I, I still was romanticizing only receiving knowledge from beekeepers who are working out in, in, in the fields and, um, and in the way that the beekeeper that I was following was working and not, I, I suppose in this moment when I joined the courses in the Beekeepers Association, I um, had this moment of acceptance of what happens when you merge all of this knowledge together um, and, you know, not take one over the other and create more, more of a horizontality uh, approach um, to, to, the whole, to the whole thing and how to move forward from that. Uh, I mean, at that point, I also had swore to myself, no more bees. I had gotten stung so many times. I, you know, I was just ready to move on to <laughs> other, other, um, I suppose other beings, maybe plants, something <laughs> a bit more softer. Um, we can go to the next slide. Um, and so also, yeah, the Beekeepers Association um, helped me to understand that they were other, um avenues of of what you do when you become a beekeeper they're mainly preoccupied with keeping bees for pollination uh purposes and not really to extract honey um they also have just you know the, they're a non-profit organization they try to collect as many bees as possible from the bee from the honey producers who let, let their bees off to die they try to contain swarms of bees um, they they try to really enter and uh, do different things within the community uh, with bees and try to essentially save the bees and introduce other ways of working with the bees um, and I had not experienced um, learning about this uh, kind of care when I was working with the beekeeper because obviously he was running a commercial practice and that's something completely different. Next slide. Uh, and so um, I did not keep the promise I made myself and the next thing I did was jump at the chance in, in uh, meeting this um, honey forager from one of the indigenous mountain tribes in Rasakhina. Um, and he, you know, this practice of honey foraging has been passed down to him ancestrally. Even the landscape that he works in is something that they've kept for many years. Um, and it's a tribe that's very specific to Ras They speak their own language. It's not a language that I know or that is taught. And um, it's, you know, it, it was also very interesting to me that I haven't ever met someone like him before in in kind of like you know the his his own setting and his own landscape uh, only in kind of you know urban situations um, and I said that to him and uh, he said um, in response that this wasn't the case before because um, based on the need that people had in the coast for uh, wood uh, and and cattle which his um, grandparents and great grandparents and ancestors really would travel down the mountains to go to the coast and trade and and, and get fish and um, and these types of goods that you would get from 
from the coast, there was a space for exchange of information and knowledge um, that was a bit more fluid. And that has completely shifted because of the way that the cities are structured now and how uh, market spaces are also structured where it's not, it's not uh, factoring in the importance of such interactions. Next slide, please. Um, and so this is his mountain, <laughs> and um, this is uh, the this is Jabal Yanis, which is a mountain range in Ras Khaimah. And what's really interesting for me in this photo is really at first glance you kind of see this arid, um, rocky mountain landscape that doesn't look like it's rich with really anything um, but that's not what he sees I mean if you focus you'll see you'll start to see like these dried shrubs but they're actually at that time that we were there some of them were in bloom if you go to the next slide um, you see more of them and you see him obviously much further than me um, his body has completely adapted as well to uh, or my body wasn't adapted to be as as fast as he was and um, he um, we were supposed to go uh, hiking to look for bees nests uh, together um, but then we managed to only see one because he turned around and every time he turned around I was much uh, farther than he anticipated and he just stopped at some point and he said clearly you are weak um, <laughs> we cannot continue this way and so um, but he was very keen on passing whatever knowledge he had about honey foraging over to me um, and and this is you know at this point I I've grown used to this generosity of passing down knowledge or passing over information and not really um, questioning what one will, will do with that kind of information. And I've uh, grown only worse with uh, taking notes or even filming or um, taking, let's say samples of things. I would just as much as possible try to absorb bio listening um, and, almost test myself as to uh, how much I can become familiar with the plant uh, uh, itself or any kind of process that he was uh, sharing with me by interaction. And that's how I can also form my own set of values when it comes to interacting with, um, with these life forms. Um, if we can go to the next slide. Um, this is an example of one of the uh, bees nests, but this is um, the bees obviously had um, abandoned this one and, and had swarmed out. But what I found really interesting is because, you know, um, I wasn't really familiar with the concept of honey foraging, I, um, I had, I, I was concerned that, you know, it's, it's still as destructive as the honey production that I've, uh, I've seen. Uh, before and he assured me that you know it wouldn't have been sustainable for them to be very destructive and they had to basically find ways to work with the wild bees and the wild bees in this instance they're not really a native species there is a native species to the Arabian Peninsula but the wild bees in the mountains I believe um, are a South Asian species that have migrated through centuries so they've acclimated of course but also bees don't care about these labels I think um, they have their own migration patterns and can estimate time and distance in their own ways and um, and this is what's also making these concepts of nationalizing the honey a bit more redundant um, as I kind of go uh, go along in, in, in my research. Um, but the difference between um, the wild bees and the bees that are imported is that the bees that are imported, because they're a European species, uh, they come with, uh, you know, their own set of, um, problems, they, they bring with them mites that the wild bees have not encountered before, they're larger in size, the wild bees are really tiny that the um, foragers call them flies um, in Arabic, the bug. Um, and, um, and, and if you can imagine, they're as tiny as, as flies actually. Um, and so 
um, I don't know when was the last time anyone has seen just a regular um, honeybee, but they can be quite large. Um, so really this also has led me to think about this ecological crisis that's unfolding because the wild bees are already facing a lot of um, uh, challenges because of the climate change and because of pollution and this constant change in landscape um, and they are um, just keep going further and further up into the mountains until I mean I don't know if they'll have any more uh, space to go up and could migrate completely or um, and we would run out there's no uh, mechanism that I'm aware of at the moment that um, uh, tries to find out what the ratio of uh, imported bees to wild bees are. I don't know if there is a way to measure any of that. This is also something I'm trying to find out. Um, but if we can go to the next slide, um, kind of want to talk about, I think, I believe that's the last slide. Um, and I just want to end here by saying where all of this has led me is to really uh, listening uh, yeah, really listening and observing the how farmers and foragers work, whether they import or they work with native or wild uh, flora um, and fauna, and um, and how they um, understand uh, the seasons and um, what experiences do they engage in when it comes to exchanging knowledge with each other? Um, what are strategies that already exist that I can kind of infiltrate and use the kind of our art platform to present? Uh, so at the moment, um, for uh, an upcoming exhibition in Warehouse 421 called On Foraging. I've been on uh, excursions with different farmers and foragers where I've mainly put them together and have started to collect their images, their own images um, to, to start to create an archive. Actually what's behind me right now is a very, very um, bad example of how I've tested this out, but trying to see also their own idealizations of uh, the landscape and what it means to them and, and what strategies they have in mind, what their suggestions and proposals are and digging into their, uh, not only their knowledge, but their imaginaries as well. So the work is also uh, going to display a mural by an active muralist who uh, is constantly being um, commissioned to, to um, portray landscape in people's homes or in certain um, towns. Um, and somehow the landscape always uh, veers towards looking like it's a mix of European and um, kind of this desert landscape at the same time. So, um, so this is where I'm at at the moment and uh, later uh, in a few months or actually next year, early next year, uh, I'm working uh, to develop uh, the seasonal calendar by the Beekeepers Association that they've created for melliferous plants, which are plants that contain uh, nectar for municipalities to um, uh, understand and, and kind of like take on board and plant uh, uh, along the roadsides instead of just planting random uh, uh, plants that are not seasonal or not mellifluous. Um, and uh, this is going to be displayed in, uh, in Sharjah for the Sharjah Biennial, uh, where I'm taking over uh, one of the uh, one of Sharjah's iconic roundabouts uh, that's the one that says smile you're in Sharjah if you're familiar with it and we're planting um, this seasonal calendar with the beekeepers association and kind of seeing what happens there almost testing it out and um, bringing in the farmers and foragers again um, with their archives and, and images and the muralist and um, the whole body of work now is called the Agriculture School, uh, which is a, a reference to an actual agriculture school that was a colonial project in Ras al Khaimah in the 50s um, that was uh, set up by the British um, when, when they were in the UAE, before, before it was the UAE. And they set up this agriculture school to teach people um, how to grow things in Ras al and make use of their landscape, uh, which, is, which was a completely misguided endeavor as well. 
because it, it, it depleted the water uh, resources because they were planting all the wrong or growing all the wrong things for that landscape. Um, and it's looking at, you know, spaces of reclamation in these, um, in these histories that can be revived and, and I suppose try to, you know, present different types of remedies for, for, for the present. Um, yeah, I mean, there's, there's a lot more that I can really say about, you know, the relationship between the necessary dis disturbances that uh, can occur, you know, between humans and other species of like plants and animals. And um, I'm really not trying to also romanticize, um, you know, going back to a certain landscape or going back to a certain way of living. I know foraging is not really also a sustainable suggestion um, or a realistic one. Um, I suppose I'm trying to extract what for, what can we learn from these mechanisms and how can we apply them in these um, micro uh, scales and um, I've yet to see what what that can do fully. Um, I also try to remind myself that I'm not a scientist <laughs> and that I'm an <laughs> that I'm an art, a lowly artist um, that's you know that's still figuring out you know a ways that image making. Um, and other and other artistic outputs can can really highlight um, can really highlight these issues, I suppose. And um, and yeah, I think I'll just end here and and allow for the discussion to uh, stretch this conversation further. Thank you so much. Melissa for that. Um, shall we take a five minute break and come back for the discussion? Sounds good. Mm -hmm. Thanks, everyone. Just drop in your questions in the meanwhile um, in either chat. Thanks.
Okay, shall we start? Um, I think Ritika's frozen. Oh, yes. I hope Ritika's frozen because otherwise. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think we'll go right ahead. That's okay with you, Moza. Oh, Ritika, your, your, your camera photo is frozen, unless you're a tremendous mime. Uh, <laughs> it's Zoom, I think. Okay. That's okay, but you're audible, so go ahead, Ritika. And um, it's Zoom, I think. Okay, sorry. I don't know if it's because of YouTube as well. Um, Hi, can you all hear me? Yes. I can also hear you, Ritika. As Moses said, yes, I, I could also hear you. Um, it could be. Sorry, everyone. Uh, this happens with uh, with our current age. Of, uh, and thanks, Moza, for being patient after your your, your wonderful presentation. Um, uh, I hope I'm audible. It might or am I not? Uh, Moza, <laughs> Thank you. you. Okay. Do, um, okay. Are we okay? Do you want to start? Um... I could. I could start. Um, I'm gonna let Ritika in, and then if she's not, if 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 there's a Oh, here she is. She's unfrozen. Oh my god. Oh my god. Okay. Great. Sorry. So sorry about that, everyone. Um, yeah. Internet issues. But thank you, Moza, so much for that very evocative talk. Um, lots to mine here. But I just kind of wanted to start by, yeah, your talk really made me think about what non-human labor looks like within our present realities, right? So thinking about the way that, you know, bee labor, like apiologic labor, um, where the product of their labor, which is honey, obviously, is directly correlated um, to this labor and then enters as a substance within the capitalist and sort of nationalist flows and these, these currents, right, um, which are obviously very anthropocentric. Um, and obviously, turns these bees then into these laboring bodies within these within these currents, right, from a particular perspective, of course. Um, and it got me thinking about the notion of them as collaborators, which you mentioned, and about, again, the origin of the word collaborator, right? It comes from to labor with, essentially. Um, and then from the way that you were describing your process, uh, these bees seem to be kind of doing their own thing they're they're working right uh they're doing what they've kind of been ingrained genetically to do and that's their labor and then your labor as an artist is to perceive to document then to materialize in perhaps in all of the mediums that you kind of described um and then you also talked about being a beekeeper for a while right and uh thinking about the word keep uh you know it it, it both means to seize but then to also to care for and to attend to and those are quite dual like emotive meanings perhaps um but anyway i was just kind of thinking about how you perceive and stand on this notion of human and non-human collaboration within these wider contexts and these entanglements of labor and projection and fantasy and um yeah all of this so yeah happy to hear from you yeah i think i and this is why i mentioned i really don't don't like using the word collaborators anymore or as much, because then that also insinuates that they've agreed to this. And the bees, I think I mentioned, they don't care. And they, they really don't care about what I'm doing. Um, they only care about what they're doing. And um, they care about survival in, in kind of their own way. And so, and so I think I started to look at it more as uh, how productive can these entanglements be? Um, and, you know, obviously, um, I think, 
humans in this case, or, or maybe me more specifically, uh, um, I'm the one who's creating these disturbances, but I, I, this is what I've kind of grown to be a bit more mindful of is what are the disturbances that are, I suppose, productive for all of us um, and accepting that these also in instances uh, have to be kept. Um, and you know, I can't, um, I can't really participate in uh, these um, the ways in which, for example, the honey forager works with the bees and understands bees in his ways, because that requires that I um, contain myself in a specific landscape that I'm not really in. Um, and and how can I do it within my own landscape, which is an urban environment? Um, and what are the problems or challenges that that are present there um, that these, you know, um, I suppose these entanglements with the bees then become necessary. And yeah, I mean, it's I'm answering your question with more questions, which is very annoying. But but really, I'm, I'm really in the blender with all of this as well. Um, because I'm also approaching it from uh, many um, I suppose entrances into uh, learning about this. Uh, like I said, uh, the knowledge from the beekeeper is very different than the uh, the knowledge uh, from the beekeepers association, which is, by the way, a course that they've adapted from a beekeepers association in the UK, uh, and they've just translated it to fit the uh, the seasonal calendar of the UAE. Um, and and what the flora is and kind of you know so they've edited there um, but but really the way that it's presented kind of like scientifically and, and all that is uh, adapt from an existing curriculum that's Western um, so so I think it's it's first of all consolidating all all this knowledge and then deciding how I can. Um, how I can present different outputs for it. Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And also the way in which, I mean, that last point was actually really interesting, this um, translation, but this adaptation of the UK, um, the UK sort of text for this uh, without perhaps even looking at the foraging um, sort of histories and the kind of knowledge that comes from outside of these particular frameworks um, of of codes and uh, these these modes of working with bees and working to produce honey and so on. Um, yeah. Rohit, did you have a question? Do you want to come in? Uh, yeah, I think Lena had something. I'm not, I know Lena's traveling a lot this month, but I'm not sure, Lena, if you're able to, to, uh, to unmute or would you like maybe, uh, yeah. or Ritika, maybe you could, could read Lena's comment for the group or Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, Lena, would you like me to go ahead? I'll, I'll just go ahead. Well, if she... also... Oh, there she is, I think. Um, I hope you hear me. Yeah. Super. Uh, thank you, Moza, a lot for the presentation. It was wonderful. It really was your work and also um, your practice in field um, as a key keeper, a beekeeper, as you mentioned. Um, and um, yeah, I, I was just wondering about, or not wondering, just really thinking about like the different dimensions that you have covered through like the, bee, the bees movement and the UAE, especially when you mentioned um, the native beekeepers and the ways in which they have um, developed this um, knowledge around how the bee kind of, um, interact with the environment as well as the, their also ancestor histories of the bees as species. Um, the layer that you mentioned about uh, Yemen, but also um, the bees that also grow um, in the mountains um, of the UAE. So th these dimensions kind of made me think about almost like how these bees register, register to the idea of this imagined community you know um and it's it's mostly like with, when you say about the nationalization of the bees you know um, a term that i always like to sometimes um work with which is introduced by political scientist benedict anderson 
who speaks about how sometimes nation states um, create this imagined community and structures and labor and so on and so forth. So this body becomes an agent of a nation state. And I know that um, Dikita last week you've mentioned um, elaborately about this idea. Um, so it's almost like this become, the body becomes an agent of uh, the state and therefore foreign to the climate. And um, so the points I highlight about this um, threat to these um, bees um, and I'm once just wondering about if you're exploring um, within the current project that you're working on of how um, these bees would be in the next let's say 40 years 30 years or actually next year you know um, yeah thank you I mean someone um I mean, I, I also, I'm constantly talking about bees in my residency as well. So someone the other day asked me if I imagine that um, there's going to be robotic bees and, and if I'm gonna do this work about robotic bees and uh, this is such a frightening thing to think about because it's also, uh, it's also very close to being real and uh, close to being kind of, you know, the, the next very misguided step into creating another form of a controlled body, whether it's a, a bee or, I mean, we've already seen it with how even robots themselves are, are nationalized uh, as well. Um, and um, I suppose throughout my practice as well, and, and this is why, why I also chose to talk a little bit about glaze, is I've been thinking about how bodies in certain environments or in, in nation states don't belong to the individual. Um, and, and this is to, to comment more, um, more expansively than just like talking about a collective society, but also like just how much a body can be controlled and mechanized. And I suppose, yeah, the bees really, you know, really presented themselves in, in the same lens as being uh, employed and exploited and looked at as disposable and exchangeable. And, um, and I think in the next work, uh, I'm trying to find as many things as possible that we've looked at this way that also can can be, you know, um, placed at at a higher value. Let's say like native flora, but native flora is not also it's it's also being disregarded. And so for me, it's it, it kind of contradicts, you know, where the value is set for certain things for certain uh, types of life if they feed a certain narrative. Um, and especially with, um, you know, just the emphasis on food security now in the Gulf, but specifically in the UAE, I'm really questioning what that means and what that entails and, um, you know, um, how destructive, you know, something that sounds, you know, sounds like it should be very safe, like being food secure, but how destructive that can be uh, environmentally. So I'm probably going to keep um, answering everyone's questions with more, more of my, my own questions. Um, so I don't know if that's helpful, but really it's just to, to also show you where I am at with all of this is it's a lot of looking and observing and kind of trying to notice as much as possible um, and releasing this need of trying to find all these answers by myself, which is I think why I even at in the first place, you know, tried to say that the bees are my collaborators. I suppose at that time I was looking at it as who are my other sources of knowledge that that are in this um, framework with me uh, or, or building this framework with me as opposed to, you know, me being the main author of, of all of it. No, for sure. And please don't apologize for opening up more questions, because that's only more potential ways for us to start thinking as well, right? It's not a closed door. Questions very much aren't closed doors the way that you're presenting them to us. So, yeah, thank you. I have another question about um, non-human knowledge, uh, because that's something that I think we keep coming back to. But um, Rohit had a comment or a question. So come in, Rohit. No, but go ahead, Ritika, because you wanted to say something on what Moza just said. So then end it. Uh, yeah, it's not quite directly correlated. I was just kind of curious about how you, because the way that you were talking about 
garnering knowledge um, from from these colonies and these hives of bees um, seemed 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 to be you observing their sort of inherited patterns of working, right? Um, so I guess my question was more about where does patterns of labor stop and where does knowledge start? And is knowledge in and of itself a kind of anthropocentric uh, projection onto their existence that we're placing? Or I'm just curious about where you're, yeah, where, where you lie on this. Uh, I'm not quite sure because that's a very interesting question. I, I suppose I've kind of categorized this all in, you know, the the work, the, the labor, and wh what else did you say? What was the binary that you presented? Oh, uh, just labor and knowledge, um, the two. Um, yeah, I suppose I've kind of put, placed it all under one category. Um, but yeah, it's it's kind of hard to also detach myself from finding, you know, poetics and metaphor and, and all of this as well, because of just my own human projections. And this is why I have to keep reminding myself by saying, like, bees do not care. <laughs> you know, uh, I don't know if, if anyone came across this article about when um, when the queen of England of, of the UK uh, died and they had to tell the bees. And I really, you know, I, they had to tell the bees that the, they had to inform the bees, uh, the royal bees, that the queen has has died. And it's really curious because I I immediately thought, well, did the bees even care? You know, like I I don't I don't think so. But I suppose it's a it's supposedly a really um, old tradition, and it's called telling the bees. Um, <laughs> So, so in all of this, uh, and why I should really start using the word collaborators less and less, um, it's really also becoming a bit more realistic about, you know, what is what I am also enforcing uh, on the bees is like what knowledge I'm extracting from them and, uh, and how I'm framing them in, in all of this. Um, and also probably why I have expanded outside of just looking at bees and, and started to engage with the people uh, more. No, for sure. This um, telling the bees thing sounds, <laughs> sounds a little bit, uh, it sounds a little bit like the sort of Deleuzean Oedipal pet complex um, situation. <laughs> You're not like the bees really care. Um, but yeah, please go ahead, uh, Rohit. Okay, uh, thank you so much, Rosa. Um, um, I, re I really, really, uh, I really appreciated the talk. Um, so, and I think this follows directly off of what uh, what 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 you and Ritika were just talking about um, right now on labor and knowledge. And so, um, I have one as usual annoying fundamental question, and then um, and then uh, sort of just a, a, a speculative question. Okay, so um, the annoying fundamental question is like, so what I really liked about your talk is that like I could see like. Um, uh, like people who die of exhaustion I, and this is also deeply selfish because i've just taught a class on fatigue and i've been yeah. thinking about this question very very and exhaustion and i've been thinking about this question a lot lately so um forgive me for that as well but um uh, the, the narcissism of the, of the question but um uh i could think of a lot of people who like are just exhaust themselves to death Right, laborers or, or you know laborers idlers as well who mm -hmm. ex 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 exhaust themselves. To them, right, um, what and this is really thanks to uh, you know the material um, and 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 you know that that I had to I had to confront because I wanted to question uh, think about the question of of, of fatigue um, a bit more deeply. What I what I started to see was that then like. And this was only with humans, so I'm not sure. And this goes to something that I think Ritika had pointed up in response to er, me last week or a couple of weeks ago, Moza, um, on 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 is there is there is there uh, you know is there a way in which um, you know um, like nature doesn't want to be exceptional or bees don't want to be exceptional? As I think you really really did a good job. I, there's no like save the bees in anything you're saying, you know. Like, and I I, I thought that was quite. It must be quite tough because I would want to save the bees if I were working with bees all the time. Although I guess the sting helps, right? And they're they're <laughs> uh, but 
Um, but what I came up with, or like what I started to think about a lot, um, but it was only with humans, is that there was like, um, in thinking about dance practices, about filmic practices, about um, everyday life, etc., is that with humans, at least there's a fatigue with fatigue, mm. right? Um, so um, even if somebody, and it's interesting because the first film I, I taught in this class and the first essay I taught in this class was on Kira Stami's Taste of Cherry. So this speaks to your first slide in a certain sense, right? Um, uh, which is all about fatigue, right? Where you have a character who, uh, you, the protagonist, uh, uh, Badi, Mr. Badi, who, if you, if you haven't seen the film, who, who, um, who basically is trying to get help to kill himself right mm -hmm. because he's so he's fatigued himself to death right mm -hmm. it, it, like like you were saying about your bees mm -hmm. but but he starts to learn that he's fatigued with fatiguing himself to death <laughs> right and so then um and he starts to learn that because it it's quickly not about like the film is not about him trying to get um uh to, to, to uh, not about him trying to get people to help him actually do the deed but to make sure that he stays dead when he does it. You know? <laughs> so so, so it, it, it's a brilliant film, but it's this doubleness of fatigue, right? Um, this fatigue with fatigue that um, I think is always there, at least with humans. I mean, I, obviously, I, do, I, I, don't, I don't know, uh, like, uh, like uh, animals and, and plants and, 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 and or, uh, but I wonder if you, it, just very speculatively, and I know this is not a, this is not an easy question to, to answer because uh, it, it's probably impossible to answer. But um, did you see any like fatigue with fatigue? Uh, j just as a human who I think projection can be good in some ways. Like, like it's just mm. like, you know, reading a novel, like, um, you know, anything, any material bees, you know, like, uh, uh, you know, build uh, like, uh, you know, anything, you know, maybe mm. as long as it helps us think about uh, critically about, uh, about something, um, uh, could be interesting. So just 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 a, a, a sort of a very speculative set of questions. One annoying, one, one annoyingly fundamental. One more speculative. I mean, it's interesting because I think I myself was fatigued, <laughs> as I mentioned. You know, when I approached this, I had already grown tired of um, the 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 anxieties and despair that uh, were contained in my previous work, my earlier work, until a very specific kind of really traumatizing moment in my life. And I think I was looking for that kind of life after despair. Um, I mean, but this film also, in, in all my films and almost all my works, there's always a death of character, whether that presents a death of ego or just this death, uh, idea of death of just like pure despair um, and hopelessness. Um, and just, you know, just the, the futility of going on or, or trying to kind of like change a system. And what became interesting for me is to present these in kind of these really mesmerizing ways as well, um, especially in a moving image format. Uh, so in the end, if, if you remember the, the scene in the end of the excerpt where you see the bees stuck in their honey, but that actually looks really beautiful. And if you remember the sound, I had collaborated with uh, a musician in the UK who's of Yemeni heritage. And I, and I suppose we had to really talk about and go into this kind of like grief of uh, of everything that um, we were carrying in our bodies over the situation uh, between our countries uh, and ourselves. And, um, and actually, uh, how can people further be manipulated by sound and kind of co-opting these um, methods of um, presenting something really eerie, whether it's sonic or or um, uh, or a moving image, uh, in kind of this really attractive, mesmerizing, and manipulative way that's controlling you into feeling cer certain things. So at that point, I was still very much thinking about these human projections, especially the disposability of life in, 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 uh, in terms of like conflict and war and militarization. Um, and then obviously the bees were still doing their thing. And so, uh, you know, at some point, 
point I had to go like, oh, wait, what are you guys doing uh, over here? And what can I also extract from that that's not pure, purely my uh, projection? And I think that's where the nourishing aspect of all of it came through. And it didn't end up being another work about despair, but it had the sense of despair, but this other source of life of just how much we can become smaller and let the bees become the, the larger part of this. Um, um, when this was displayed in, in Hay Jamil, um, and I was talking to a journalist and he had closed his recorder, I said to him, this work is actually about war. And he said, listen, I cannot write this. Um, but what I can write is all the environmental uh, aspects that this, this work has um, presented and and I was also grateful for for those realms that opened that that were outside of my control a little bit as well um but uh but yeah I mean this you know this this was really born out of so much fatigue like uh, even the the physical excur uh, like exertion of being out there filming getting stung uh, working you know during ramadan as well in, in the heat um and and kind of putting my own body through what the beekeepers uh put their bodies through and then having to come back with all this material and sit in front of it and just ask it to tell me what it wants to do to itself um well, yeah no, i mean i i really like that i i really and i just wanted to and then i'll stop and and, and I, again i really liked your presentation a lot um i really liked what you said because um this notion of uh but like and this also i think somewhat goes back to ritika's um presentation and then um also anticipates ben Ware's presentation um which will come up um but there's a certain liberation to stuckness to not just keeping on going, right? I, so I really like what you said about the beauty of stuckness, right? Mm -hmm. um, um, and I don't know if you've ever had a chance to read uh, the the brilliant um, uh, Protestant um, uh, Islamic theologian, this Protestant but Islamic theologian, Henri Corbin, um, on the eighth climate, right? Which is you know, like uh, uh, on Dawim. It's 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 like um. It's the it's the creative possibilities of stuckness of what mm -hmm. something like a, a lurching forth, you know, um, from occupying the space of stuckness, right, as opposed to perpetual movement forward. Um, mm -hmm. It's it, and 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 I I'm going to stop there. I will I will talk to you uh, offline. But um, but I really really um, appreciated your presentation. So thank you very much, Moza. Thank you. Thank you, Rohit. Um, no, that was just such a stunning image of um, the this, this stuckness and the movement. There was still movement, but in these tiny, tiny, incremental, like infinitesimal ways that seem to be going nowhere, but it's still happening. Things are still being produced and generated. Um, it's also curious that um, someone, I'm not quite sure, the maybe gallerist or the curator or someone told you that you couldn't say that this is about war because even if the, the active, yeah. yeah, the journalist, right? Uh, which is just crazy because this is metaphor and it's also fact and it is also an affective, um, you know, sort of both metaphor and fact in and of itself. So it's really, yeah. Yeah, and this is why I, I, I started the, uh, the presentation with the, with the excerpt of the text that I read. It's because this, this traditionally has been what what we've grown accustomed to as well, I think regionally, which is not really looking at these um, modes of censorship as something that is, um, you know, that's that's a defeated stance, uh, but really rather a, a space of richness that, you know, can be, we can extract more, m more ways to say or to talk about something. Um, and you know, and kind of to to appeal to more senses, I, I suppose. Um, yeah. No, thanks for that. Um, we have about half an hour, so yeah, let's try to keep I guess comments and questions a little bit brief. Uh, I think Ramisha is up. Yeah, Ramisha, you can just turn on your video and go. Hello. Hello. Um, Hi. Um, first of all, I would like to tell you that I experienced to work at Lahore Biennial at Park oh, House, and um, it was 
it was the, the, the like it stood out of course because you you get to eat <laughs> <laughs> so uh, um uh, rather than like uh, at that time uh, during the biennial so there's a lot of work displayed here and there um parallel to each other and going to park the house and uh, taking a break for tea and experiencing your work um as a break <laughs> and being able to eat uh, was itself enjoyable uh secondly i enjoyed the fact that you were talking about something that's too sensitive by giving us food uh that's honey and bees and uh towards the end we were like we were offered fresh naan and honey uh in cream uh two years ago and zaf jafran tea i remember i i don't remember the names that were on the menu of this um of this um the jelly a book of pandan yeah <laughs> yeah so um uh, it, it was it was lovely and uh, quite memorable um secondly i uh, while you were talking about your presentation on bees i i follow this uh, artist and a scientist and an architect iranian um a scientist called miri oxman i don't know if you've heard of it of her uh uh i just shared her uh, links over here in 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 the um, in the chat and uh, she is brilliant uh, she works with bees uh, as a scientist uh and an artist um uh, the, uh so uh, she says that she enters into a cross kingdom relationship um that deliberately stands in contrast to the typical anthropocentric view and acknowledges that we cannot operate in isolation as we build and create i think uh, this is um that that's what she's working with um bees and silk worms and um when when you in your uh, presentation said that i keep reminding myself that i'm an artist and not a scientist uh she just popped um uh, in my head because um uh, her work uh, as a scientist uh is very focused on um on it, it enjoys the leverage um that nature um um has to give and uh, so her works are called uh, synthetic apiary 1 and 2 uh, she enjoys uh, 3d printing um and in in synthetic apiary 1 she uh, uses bees and studies her research is about how can bees live for all round the year uh there's a video of of the work um if you just click on the link uh you you'll find another link in between and you'll enjoy the work just wanted to just wanted to um thank you so much yeah when i said that i you know i i didn't mean it as i you know i wish i was a scientist and, and not yeah. an artist i think for me it's more like the realization of how many voices can enter this as well without me going through the process of you know just you know getting i i suppose also professionalizing this as like you know veering off into into science and becoming that or um or just a beekeeper or let's say you know getting into farming and in those ways where i become fully um and enveloped in, in in these things just like i did when i went to culinary school um which i think as far as i can go with with getting <laughs> just you know um getting into these food environments in in this way and um but yeah no i'll be sure to check out the work thank you so much for yeah, your yeah of course it's your again it's your choice as an artist and just pop uh, the name popped up in my head and i wanted to share it thank you thank you so much ramesha um rico did you want to come in and uh, and a second uh i uh, can you hear can you hear me yeah we can i'm just ah uh, here we go here we go um so uh, yeah bees what a rich subject i mean where to start uh, i got so much to say but i'm going to i'm going to just keep it short with a couple of just with a few questions which which go from the sort of semi rational first question to i i you know to the progressively stranger um so you you spend a fair amount of time talking about um you know bees native non native bees 
Um, so I, I have just, just you know, I, I, I'm going to give you a series of questions. Don't, don't feel obliged to answer any of them particularly. But what would have happened if there were native bees, right? How, how, how might your project have gone? Uh, and you, 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 you uh, mentioned also just in, in response to one of the questions, same thing about native plants. Right, so it's, it's a similar question. So, so that's just a speculative question. Where, where, where might the project have mm. gone? But, um, but and now I, I just want to make a, a couple of brief comments. Right? So this idea about uh, telling the bees, right? Uh, and so the thought that, crop, that popped into my head as you said that, it's like, you don't tell the bees that the queen is dead for the bees. Yes. Right? <laughs> it's not for the bees, it's for the cosmos. Right, it's from one queenly society to another one that you're you're kind of echoing through the cosmos. I think that that might be what's behind it. Um, but then you know all that talk when you when you were replying to to Rohit's question, uh, and I had written something down and I thought no 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 I'm not going to ask that. But but in fact I, I am going to ask this now, which is, do you love bees? <laughs> and, and and I'm assuming that you do, and then. <laughs> I want to see the movie that you make about your love for the bees. <laughs> I, I want to see you make the movie about the poetics of bees. And, you know, there could be another movie about, you know, the, the aggression of the bees or the attack of the bees or the generosity of the bees. But, but something about the poetics of bees that speaks to your love of them, right? Or the tragedy of the bees, whatever, whatever. So I'm, I, so that's just why I, I would love to see that movie, partly because already, of course, you know that image. And of course, I was struck by that image of the bees drowning in, bees drowning in honey, right? Um, and there's so much of that in your, in, already in the filmmaking. I would just love to see a whole movie about that. So I'll, I'll stop there. Thanks. Okay. Uh, so what would have happened if, the, if there were these native bees? Uh, it would have been a different work or possibly not have materialized into work, really. I think because, like I said, I, I entered this purely out of the intention of, of learning how to become a beekeeper and was just filming all of this to record, you know, information. And, and, um, and yeah, I didn't go in kind of like with a crew, like I did all the camera work and wasn't really thinking about lighting or time or because I was really, you know, working with the timeline of the beekeeper and whatever information he had for me, um, which then switched because I was presented with all of the, this new information um, and it started to develop into a work in which I would even, like I said, you know, just um, switch off the camera in front of the beekeeper to, to show him that, yeah, I'm still trying to absorb this and everything that you're saying without the performance of, of you um, and, and more about, you know, what, what do I do with this knowledge uh, now? And I don't know, the, the te telling the bees, I don't know if it's just telling the bees if a monarch has, has died. Maybe I, I need to look more into it. <laughs> um, but, uh, but um, you know, a, a film that, that I make that is just about my love for bees sounds like such a generous gift to myself that maybe I should embark on. But I have to say that it's not... Um, this is not my first film about bees or, or honey. And I've actually been really preoccupied with the character of the queen always um, as, as this body that's the most disposable, that is the, the most and least functional body in the hive uh, that depending on her functionality, uh, the workers can either, uh, you know, uh, revere her or overthrow her or kill her or, you know, they decide. And so it's kind of like this mock, you know, mock system as well of, of hierarchy uh, where there's no real hierarchy and there's just pure survival. Um, and so I think the cruelty or what I categorize as cruelty of the bees um, keeps taking me into these avenues of, of creating these outputs that are not pure, you know, love <laughs> or an expression of love. <laughs> they keep surprising me. 
um, and fascinating me in these ways that I think become a bit more compelling um, than, you know, me just um, creating this romantic film about my love for the bees. Maybe one day. <laughs> Thank you, Moza. Um, yeah, what you were saying about the Queen got me thinking in some slightly strange directions, but uh, reminding me of some of Preciado's work, for example, on um, the womb as the sort of space of essentially reproductive state power, right? And I was kind of thinking about the alignments and the parallels that we could draw with perhaps the queen bee within the hive and this disposable sort of womb um, in, in some ways. but. Yeah, have you have uh, so I'm, I'm curious about more of uh, I'm curious about your thinkings and 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 ongoing, I guess, um, yeah, ongoing thoughts about the queen bee as a character. I'm, I'm, I'm curious about what that is going to potentially develop into. And uh, yeah, I mean, this is really where it landed, right, is when I started to look at the Emirati queen, because that's the when they when they started to do these hybrids, they um, resulted in Emirati queens um, and those Emirati queens were laying eggs in these you know hives that are, you know are bred in Egypt and um, are European species so so it all got mixed there and I think that's really where it landed as well but before my my expressions about that before was just you know I suppose it's just this um cycle of exposing this disposability um even before I learned so much about the bees like in in technical ways uh, or practical ways um and uh I feel like I've I've kind of exhausted that in my work at the moment and probably exhausted the topic of bees <laughs> um but yeah, I, I mean, we can still link this back to what, what I said before about, uh, you know, the, the body that's controlled and, and this character that's only um, made important according to its functionality and it serves a purpose for, uh, for the organization that, it's in, that it fits in. And as soon as it kind of just doesn't, add, you know, doesn't function in the same way, then it is punished or yeah, killed tells or, me that. Um... yeah yeah no for sure uh, i think Barry Barton wanted to come in with a comment or a question hi uh thank you for the for this talk uh, uh my camera is off because i'm in a remote area in a dark uh, forest or somewhere um i enjoyed the talk very much uh you are constantly laughing and uh, and that kind of gave certain kind of pleasure uh, looking at you and hearing you. But I sense a certain kind of guilt or sadness throughout the talk, particularly the kind of image you showed, uh, that image with uh, like a little bit of vegetation, mostly dry and whitish, uh, like pale, like, uh, I don't know, my English is a little uh, troubled, so... Um, so I, I I don't know, I just felt uh, there is certain kind of guilt, uh, particularly the image you showed with the, uh, the honey and the dead bees and another uh, another uh, uh, sentence where you where talk that bees dies, dies of exertion. Um, I'm wondering that, uh, and also there is another guilt where you say that bees don't care. And they, they particularly see that sadness in your face, that they don't care about humans. Uh, my question is, if, if suppose bees, bees care about humans, do you think it, it would be a celebration for you or for human beings? And if it would be a celebration, then what kind of celebration it would be? Um, I, I mean, if there's a research that comes out that says bees actually do care, when you tell them something and they they care about collaboration, yeah, of course that'll make me very happy. It'll make things easier. Um, yeah, no, I think the work does contain a lot of sadness, and um, this goes back to maybe Rico's questions as well of um, you know what what the work 
would have been if if I wasn't faced with all of these realities and what I also take on to to communicate uh, what I found you know the work really essentially even if it's you know fictional and uh, I mean obviously the the documentation is not fictional but the narrative is fictional and it contains all all of these layers that are supposed to kind of um uh, I don't know what's the right word for this, but, you know, I, I, I suppose uh, present a layer of, of opaqueness as well, um, and, and it can be read in, in multiple ways. Um, and so, I, yeah, it, it was really a lot, it was a lot of sadness uh, putting this together. It was a lot of, um, I, it was a lot of defeat, but like I said as well, there were these avenues of also, um, well, here's what else we can do out of uh, out of the sadness and out of these realizations and realities. I'm also becoming less and less romantic about going back to um, a landscape or or a type of world um, that is, um, you know, like less cruel, cleaner, uh, more sustainable. I think I'm I'm really setting into the reality of what can we do now? Like what what kind of um, what kind of disturbances, uh, you know, like I said, are, are necessary for, for the landscape now um, and where that could lead us without, you know, my, you know, without myself drowning in, in the honey with the bees, you know, just um, thinking that everything could, could become okay or that, that the way forward is to educate the beekeepers on on you know having a more sustainable um practice like that's not they're just being pragmatic like they're they're being practical um it's not them that need to change their ways as much as we need to look at like the larger systems that hold them i suppose really hold them hostage to the ways in which they find themselves that they have to work um so yeah i i try to you know, I try to stay um, hopeful and keep my sunshiny demeanor, <laughs> but it is a lot of sadness for sure. Yeah. Yeah, it certainly doesn't make sense to sort of create these characters of these villains and, and vilify the beekeepers and, um, you know, the people and the human bodies that we see across your work and hold them as the scapegoats for a very, very complex and entrenched system. Um, you know, that you've laid out for us over here. Um, I guess another question that I had was about wildness and nativeness and indigeneity, which I think Rico also mentioned. And you said the bees that were in the mountains were of an Asian, uh, came, came from Asia or migrated from Asia and they kind of were assimilated into the landscape, right? I guess my question is more actually to do with language and how we denote notions of nativeness and indigeneity. And of course, we spoke about the Emirati B and all of these things, right? Um, how how are you navigating all of these constructs of this nomenclature of geopolitics, I guess, within this B landscape? I mean, this is why I, I kind of presented it, presented it as, you know, what is the relevance of indigeneity? Because, you know, I can't call them native because they weren't taxonomized as such, but that doesn't really mean anything if they've completely um, acclimatized to the landscape and are, you know, major producers and pollinators of uh, in the landscape and are effective uh, participants uh, in the in the larger assemblage of of, of that landscape, and so. Um, uh, and so uh, I'm, I suppose I'm just calling things as they are known, but that's not really how I uh, have kind of like just fully resolved and deemed them to be as well. Oh, you're mute. Uh, yeah, no worries, sorry. I think Rohit had some more comments or questions. Do you want to come in, Rohit? Yes, yeah, sorry, I'm just kind of fiddling with the, how to start the video. Um, okay, uh, yeah, no, this is great. Um, uh, the conversation I you know, also um, really learned uh, a bunch from. 
Thank you, Moza. Um, um, I'm also curious about uh, the queen bee, right? Um, and I'm, I'm I'm wondering about how you might position this work, because what I what I really okay, hold on, let me start over. Okay, sorry, Moza. Uh, but <laughs> but uh, what I really really liked about the your mode of presentation, right? Which I think is a really important. Uh, uh, I know we don't take it that seriously, but it's we're all content people, but the form of your presentation, right? And I think Pari got to this as well. Um, he was able to, it's precisely because of your mode or your form of presentation today that, um, you know, he was able to see see, see affect, right? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, in a way that generate, was very generative of, 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 of this, of this, of, 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 of your last, that generated your last response, right? Um, but I wonder, like, I wonder if that sadness, like, um, or, or as Pari, and guilt is complex. I mean, um, I think I understand what he's saying about guilt. Um, and I, like, I wonder if, um, again, given your mode of presentation, which was not at all, like, um, it was, because so, I was expect. can I be honest with you, Moza? I was expecting it to be anthropocentric. I was expecting it to be save the bees. You know, yeah. uh, you know, and and I, I was very, very ref like, um, but but so now how do I think about it's not save the bees, but as Pari Bartana said, and and you know, and you 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 confirmed like there is still an affect of 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 of, of sadness, right? Um, to 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 the project. Um, so I wonder if like uh, foregrounding, or you may maybe not because you do it so well without foregrounding it. Um. But just foregrounding the fact that this really is maybe about like inter, like uh, presenting it more interrogatively, like, and then maybe you will. My interest is that you will feel less sad, Moza, right? Is 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 uh, because I like you very much, um, and I don't want you to feel sad. But um, <laughs> my um, like uh, um, like maybe this is maybe this is um, maybe this is a. Uh, 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 you know, um, you, you don't like the solution is that you don't. There, there, there is no response from the bees. It wouldn't be easier if they responded. It would be harder. You know, you're with humans all the time uh, who responded. You know, they, 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 they don't shut up, right? Um, 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 like, uh, and, and and there's a lot of sadness in that. So maybe, maybe the, maybe the, um, maybe the solution to the melancholy that I think uh, was coming coming across through your your wonderfully non-anthropocentric form could be to try and foreground what I think is a really, really difficult thing you've accomplished, which is a, a mode of doing this um, non-anthropocentric, right? Like um, that, 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 that you should actually feel um, like there's no uh, return to sender going mm -hmm. on. Mm -hmm. Right, um, mm -hmm. in the way in which you're 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 presenting your interaction or your uh, with with, with um, yes, not just the bees, but the people who are keeping the bees, and it's very clear. It's a very nuanced um, mm -hmm. uh, project. It's it's something I've never you know, um, and and I would be lying if I didn't say I was I, I wasn't I was I, I wasn't sure where this was going to go. You know, like because uh, bees, you know, like you know, like uh, you know, they, <laughs> <they're> like <laughs> um, so. Um, maybe it's just another bit of material. Like maybe it's bees are more human than you think. Like, or maybe we're more bee than than like. So you don't like you don't even need to have a dividing line between you and bee, um, and then feel sad about um, you know the fact that there's no uh, dialogic relationship because you, you the dial dialogue is already happening quite rigorously with your own nature, right? This is really a dialogue yeah. with your own human nature and. Um, uh, an analysis of your own human nature, and I, uh, and I think going out, like going to another, like going to bees is like going to uh, uh, Mace or going to Ritika or going to Rico or going to Frank or going to Ramisha or going to whoever is on my, right? Um, it's it's the same thing, right? Um, but it really foregrounds um, uh, that deep otherness within us that is called nature, right? Um, yeah. So also that that, but I I love this. I, I I'm so I'm so grateful that you gave this, and I I, I thank you.
Thank you. I mean, yeah, I mean, I really did want to uh, problematize this idea of like still placing ourselves at the top of things of how we think things should shift. I mean, one of my favorite films uh, or filmmakers really is uh, is Hayao Miyazaki. Um, uh, and the, my favorite film that he's done is uh, Princess Mononoke. Um, because really, I mean, at, at the heart of, of a lot of his films as well, or, uh, his animations, is the idea that if we don't all find a way to come together uh, without having, you know, like the, the human character being the, the one that determines really everything, but if we don't all find a way to come together, then we're, you know, we can only expect more loss and more devastation. Um, and um, and for the crisis to just keep growing, um, and I feel like this has existed in you know this has just ex existed in literature and in um, um, in nature itself, you know. Um, and so I think I've, I'm trying to contribute to that conversation with my work um, is how uh, you know how much of this can be expanded beyond. Um, the, not just the human and the animal, but also, you know, um, plants and, and um, the seasons and really all of it coming together. And, 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 I, and you and us. And you and yeah, you exactly. And so, yeah, so like, yes, yes, good. But yeah. then we all just get smaller and smaller and it just becomes more expansive rather than, you know, and, and more horizontal. Um, and yeah, I think the sadness is because those ideals of like what, uh, you know, I think it's just a, uh, a jab at my savior complex, you know, <laughs> just <laughs> um, of, you know, you cannot really expect to save anything, not the bees or, or even yourself. Um, yeah. Yeah. Last, last quick thing. So, oh, sorry, Ritika, can I just say one? Because I'll yes, forget please, this. Please. I, I know I'm going to, I'm going to email Mo's. Uh, <laughs> please do. No, no, just one, just, so again, deeply narcissistic, the comment, but uh, uh, I had recently rewatched re for class um, uh, Werner Herzog's. Uh, I taught this film. Uh, it's a, it's an, it's an amazing film called Aguirre. Um, the wrath of God um, uh, in in my class on fatigue and um, uh, El Dorado gold is is what everyone is after right um, uh, Klaus Kinski it, it, it's a it, it, and in a in a beautifully horrifying way everything goes wrong um, mm. right and Vikram Devecha, who I'm sure you know. Um, mm -hmm. I, Ritika, I'm sorry, I'm being really bad, be, badly behaved, but it's just because I will not remember this uh, if I don't say it. Now. It needs um, to be on YouTube so we can all recall and, and go back to it. No, the, seriously, keep going. Okay, okay, but so quickly, Vikram Devecha, I just saw on the uh, the the Insta Instagram, like uh, like the uh, the social media, whatever, right? For, on our uh, our institute. Um, um, uh, who's he? He's just uh, done a brilliant piece called El Dorado, uh, uh, the the promise of a city of gold. And 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 um, I don't. I want you to. Can I just ask if you give me the liberty of just considering um, seeing if you haven't Herzog's film, uh, 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 Aguirre, The Wrath of God, um, maybe having a look at. Uh, and mm -hmm. talking to Vikram because you guys are close, right? You're in, you're in, or you're close prox geographically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're, and yeah. and 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 um, thinking about your project, um, um, and then uh, I'd love to hear if you come up with anything. So that's it. I'm st I'm stopping being bad. <laughs> thank so. you. No, thank you. And actually, Roy, that goes into something that I wanted to kind of ask about um, gold and. This, I, I, that, I mean, your talk is entitled Gold, but we haven't actually talked about gold as a substance right. and all of its sort of manifestation, the multi, the multivalency of gold as both metaphor and substance and all these things, right? Um, I, I, anything you want to say about that before? I think we have a so the title was uh, was extracted from what the beekeeper said when he was admiring um, the the honey extraction, and he was like, "There is." Uh, 
there is a gold that is worn and there is an edible gold. He said it in, uh, in Arabic. And, you know, just his eyes were glittering and he, you know, was totally in love with, with all of this. In, in, and when you zoom in and you see the honey, yes, it's mesmerizing, but when you zoom out, it's complete destruction and, and devastation. So, yeah, that's where it comes from. Thank you so much, Moza, on that very, very, um, you know, evocative image and this arresting image. Um, thank you so much for uh, this incredible talk that resists all of the usual modes that, you know, as Roy was talking about, this descent into either save the, you know, blank or, you know, the bleakness, the giving into the bleakness or this idea of the eco-utopian or the primitivist, right? And resisting all of these modes and giving us something, um, yeah, m far more nuanced than that. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you all for joining us as well. Um, see you at the next talk.